Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I am Carl Garcia, Technical Support Scientist here at ACD. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that the audience will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function to If you have a question, please use the Q&A function to the right of the web, WebEx window. Please address your questions to all panelists. My colleagues will address your questions in real time. Here's a quick overview of the topics I'll be covering today. I will begin with an overview of our RNA scope technology, followed by the general workflow and troubleshooting guidelines. I will then briefly discuss the different applications of the technology and finish with frequently asked questions. So let's begin by going over the RNA scope technology. The RNA scope assay is an NT2 hybridization technique that utilizes a unique double Z target probe design, followed by a signal amplification system, which allows you to visualize a single mRNA transcript as a punctate dot through either chromogenic or fluorescent de detection. This highly specialized system utilizes simultaneous signal amplification and background suppression methodology. RNA scope is compatible with a wide range of sample types such as FFPE, fixed frozen, as well as fresh frozen. RNA scope can be used to detect multiple mRNA targets using, uh, using one tissue section. To date, we have over 1,900 peer-reviewed publications using the RNA scope and base scope technologies. This shows the increase in market adoption of the RNA scope and base scope assays utilized in many different research and amplification, application areas fields such as cancer research, neuroscience, and infectious diseases. Here is a brief overview of the RNA scope workflow. RNA scope is a, assay is a slide based assay and is intended for use on sample types similar to that used with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence. The assay starts with permeabilizing the sample with reagents provided in the pretreatment kit. The pretreatment allows unmasking of the target mRNAs, thus allowing the target probe to penetrate into the cell and hybridize the target RNA sequence. The target probe is a pool of oligos that are designed using our established bioinformatics algorithm, which allows for target specificity. A series of amplification cascades then and amplify the signal, and RNA molecules can be visualized under the microscope as punctate dots. The signal can also be quantified semi-quantitatively or quantitatively using an image analysis software. The primary feature of our RNA scope technology is the probe design. Represented here are the oligonucleotide target-specific probes as double Zs. They have two unique regions connected by a linker. Additionally, each one of these oligonucleotide sequences have been designed using an informatics algorithm which selects sequences that specifically bind to the target sequence of interest. This design confirms that the oligonucleotide sequences do not cross-hybridize with any other sequences the sequence at the bottom of the Z is complementary to the target transcript and hence hybridizes. In order for amplification to occur, two Zs must hybridize to the target sequence right next to each other. Once this happens, it creates uh, around 50 base target specific binding site on the bottom of the double Z pair. The top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize, it creates a binding site upon which a pre-amplifier can bind and then the amplification tree can be built. A standard RNA scope probe for a target sequence of about 1,000 bases or more consists of about 20 double Z pairs pulled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region. This allows for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, only a few double Z pairs are needed to bind to the target RNA sequence to generate enough signal for molecular detection. Here is a schematic showing the hybridization and the subsequent amplification of the RNA scope assay. The double Z probe will bind to the target mRNA transcript. Once the double Z probe binds, it serves as a foundation and binding site for the pre-amplifier molecule. Once the pre-amplifier is bound, it serves as a binding site for the amplifier molecules. 
and each amplifier can then further bind multiple labeled probes sequentially, hybridizing to assemble a branching complex at each double Z binding site. Label probes can contain a chromogenic enzyme such as HRP that generates a visible signal after a chromogenic reaction such as with DAB, detectable under a standard bright field microscope. The labeled probes can also contain fluorophores that allow for visualization of the signal under a fluorescent microscope. This signal amplification strategy provides for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule. If a single Z binds to the target mRNA transcript, the preamplifier cannot bind as it needs both double Zs to provide a binding site. This helps to ensure that the specificity of the probes and helps reduce potential background staining. In order to detect multiple mRNAs simultaneously, multiple amplification trees must be built. That being said, we must ensure specificity. The specificity is ensured by adding a unique tail sequence to the probes. This means to the double Z probe design, we will have a tail sequence that is indicative of a channel designator. For example, a channel 1 probe has a specific channel 1 tail sequence that will only allow for binding of the subsequent T1 amp preamplifier, amplifier, and label probe molecules. Similarly, a C2 probe will have a separate and unique tail sequence. Moving over to a summary of our manual RNA scope assays available, this slide represents all the assays that are available from ACD. If you have a single um, ish target, you may choose a single plex assay such as the chromogenic brown or red assay. If you have two targets, you may choose the chromogenic duplex assay. Both of these assays are available on manual and the automated platform. If you are interested in multiplexing, our multiplex fluorescent assay allows to detect up to four targets simultaneously in a single tissue section. So in the next few slides, I will discuss the RNA scope amplification and detection systems for the manual assays. In this slide, the diagrams here depict the single plex amplification system. Pictured here is the amplification tree, which is then tethered by an enzyme. To the left is the depiction of the red assay, which utilizes alkaline phosphatase and can then be visualized by a fast red chromogen. Likewise, for the brown assay shown in the right, it, the assay utilizes HRP and is visualized by DAB chromogen. And here's a brief overview of the duplex amplification system. Both probe channels have independent amplification trees. The channel 2 associated amplification tree utilizes alkaline phosphatase enzyme and the fast red substrate for the visualization of the marker. A separate amplification tree is built for the C1 channel, which utilizes HRP enzyme and the green substrate to visualize the second marker. Please note that our C1 probes by default are ready to use and are at 1x in concentration, while the C2 probes are provided as 50x stocks. In order to make a duplex probe mixture, combine the C2 probe with C1 probe in 1 to 50 dilution. If you would like to test the channel 2 probes alone, please use the RNAscope probe dilument and combine at 1 to 50 dilution. Moving on with the multiplex fluorescent assay. This assay utilizes the same amplification system and is similar to the duplex chromogenic assay. Here, three independent amplification trees are built such as that C1, C2, and C3 probes will have their own amplification trees stemming from where the probe has bound to the mRNA transcript. The signal can then be visualized from three independent fluorescent label probes. And here is the multiplex fluorescent V2 assay. This can be used to detect up to four mRNA targets. Here, four independent amplification trees are built such that the C1, C2, C3, and C4 probes will have their own amplification trees built from the mRNA target. The signal can then be visualized using Perkin Elmer's TSA based amplification technology or the OPAL dyes. Next, we will move on to the RNA scope assay workflow. With the RNA scope assays, you may perform the assay as a one day assay. If you would like, there are a couple of options to split this protocol into two days. 
The first option would be to complete the sample preparation and pretreatment on day one, and then begin with probe hybridization and detection the following day. Please do refer to the technical notes recommended for your sample type to determine where the stopping point may be feasible. If unsure, please do contact technical support for recommendations. The second option for splitting into a two-day assay would be to complete sample preparation, pretreatment, and probe hybridization on the first day, then incubate the slides overnight in a 5x saline sodium citrate solution. The following day, you would remove the slides from the 5X SSC and wash them with a wash buffer, then follow with the amplification reagent. This is highly recommended with a duplex and multiplex fluorescent V2 assays, as these are much longer assays with several more amplification steps. And here is an overview of the workflow for singleplex chromogenic assay using FFPE samples. The singleplex assay can take about, one, about eight hours please refer to part one of the user manual for sample preparation and pretreatment recommendations. The assay workflow has four major steps, pretreatment, hybridization, amplification, and finally, staining and detection. The workflow for both FFPE and fixed frozen samples require a heat-mediated target retrieval step followed by its protease digestion for pretreatment. The workflow on the Lycabon RX and Ventana automated systems are very similar to the manual assay. Similarly, the fluorescent multiplex assay contains the four major parts, but it is a shorter assay. Again, please refer to the user manual for detailed recommendations. Please note that you need to choose only one M4 alt option among the ones recommended in the user manual. And here is a more detailed workflow for the multiplex fluorescent V2 assay. Similar to the previous workflow diagram, pretreatment is completed first followed by the target probe hybridization and subsequent amplification steps. This differs from the previously mentioned fluorescent assay as each channel is developed sequentially. The AMP1, 2, and 3 steps are a pooled combination of the pre-amplifier and amplifier molecules so that the amplification trees begin to, shorn, to form simultaneously. This schematic shown here uses the fluorescein, Psi3, and Psi5 in the C1, C2, and C3 respectively but these may be mixed and matched as per your preference. And here are what the RNA-scope reagent kits that you can expect from ACD. Each kit con configuration includes a pretreatment reagent, detection kit, as well as the wash buffer. And presented here are some recommended accessories required for running the manual RNA-scope assay. To the top left are the two options for washing and handling slides. You may use either the Tissue Tech wash, trait common in most labs, or you can use our Easy, slide, easy Batch Slide Processing System, which was designed to streamline your RNA scope assays and save handling time when working with a large number of samples. The Hybeasy Hybridization System, shown on the top right, is designed to maintain the optimal temperature and humidity to ensure optimal and consistent RNA scope staining. Below are two methods for carrying out the heat-mediated target retrieval step required for some sample types such as FFPE or fixed frozen samples. Our website has training videos on the different steps of the manual assay, which is, great, which is a great visual guide to assist with running the RNA-scope manual assay. And here are some general tips to ensure success with your RNA-scope assays. First, we recommend to follow the protocols we have various protocols with necessary details to help address the best way to run the assay. Next, sample pretreatment is very important to ensure that you get the most optimal RNA scope signal. The pretreatment conditions will differ from sample type to sample type and may require, require some optimization. Using controls is highly recommended, especially when you are troubleshooting your assay. And lastly, it is critical to make sure that you have all the components required to run the assay before you begin the assay. And here is an example of our sa recommended sample preparation for formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples. With FFPE samples, we recommend fixing with 10% NBF at 16 to 32 hours for room at room temperature. The recommended sample thickness is 4 to 6 microns, and we also recommend that the tissue is mounted onto Superfrost Plus slides. 
In order to preserve RNA quality, it is recommended to store sections with desiccant at room temperature for up to three months. For long-term storage, it is best to store at four degrees with desiccant. For fresh frozen samples, please review the user manual for detailed recommendations. A few highlights are presented here. We recommend storing frozen tissue blocks or sections airtight at minus 80 degrees Celsius for up to three months. The recommended sample thickness is 10 to 20 microns, again, mounted on Super, super Frost Plus slides. Besides preparing samples according to our recommended protocol, it is very important to have proper controls for the RNA scope assay. If you are running RNA scope assay for the very first time, we recommend running positive and negative control probes on a control slide such as the HELAS in order to ensure that the assay is set up in the lab optimally. Then proceed running the assay using a control probes on your sample to assess the sample RNA quality and to determine the best pretreatment conditions based on the signal detected and tissue morphology. If your sample passes QC, you can then move on to running your target probe. Otherwise, it is recommended to verify your technique, check RNA quality, or perform assay optimization. I will be discussing our scoring guidelines in a later slide. And on this checklist are some other key components that can help ensure your success with RNA-scope RNA -scope assay. For example, please use SuperFrost Plus slides and use the HyBZ hybridization system. Moving on to a recommended general guidelines, such as once you begin the assay, do not let the slides dry out, and please warm probes and wash buffer at 40 degrees C due to precipitation. And when running the RNA scope assays, here are a few factors that could affect the outcome of your results. For example, fixation conditions are not optimal, or the hybridization conditions are not optimal. These factors and issues can be addressed by the following solution, solutions, such as the ones listed here. Please fix the samples as recommended. Use the HyBZ hybridization systems for optimal hybridization conditions. In the next few slides, I will be discussing some of the key guidelines pertaining to each of the manual assays. For the chromogenic brown assay, it is our, one of our most robust assays. It is an ideal assay for tissues that have AP-dependent backgrounds, such as kidney. But this assay is not ideal when using tissues that are subject to pigmentation, such as lung or skin samples. For the red chromogenic assay, the fast red chromogen is used in both the Arniscope red assay and base scope assay. We recommend using either eco mount or vector mount media to help best preserve staining. The chromogen is sensitive to alcohol and if exposed, you may cause signal diffusion. The chromogen is sensitive to alcohol and if exposed, you may cause signal diffusion after chromogen development. The slide should not go through ethanol dehydration, but instead we recommend drying the slides in a drying oven at 60 C. In the chromogenic duplex assay, your C1 probe will be visualized in green and your C2 probe will be visualized in red. A few critical points to note here are sensitivity of both of the red and green chromogens to alcohol. Therefore, this should not be um, dehydrated using alcohol prior to mounting. Please note that the HRP green chromogen mix, green A and green B, may precipitate out of solution as a result of evaporation if the vial has been left loosely capped or left at room temperature. While the precipitate may not affect the staining quality intensity, we recommend adding a wash step right after the green chromogen development. Please use please wash the stain slides for one minute with 1x RNA scope wash buffer, and after that with water for approximately 30 seconds. If you observe precipitation in your solution, please, uh, please contact technical support. For the fluorescent V1 assay, you can use different AMP4 alternatives. Those are AMP4 Alt A, B, or C for the different fluorophore combinations. We recommend using prolonged gold anti-fade mounting media to preserve fluorescence. And for the multiplex fluorescent V2 assay, 
This is a TSA-based asset. TSA Plus Floor 4s or Opal dies have to be purchased from Perkin Elmer. Again, we recommend using Prolong Gold Anti-Fade as a mounting medium. Now the question is, which fluorescent assay will be right for you? The first assay, Fluorescent Multiplex V1, is best used with fresh frozen samples. This consists of labeled probes directly conjugated to the fluorophores. This assay allows for a three plexing capability of three mRNA markers simultaneously in your ad tissues or cells. The second assay, Multiplex Fluorescent V2, is a TSA-based assay where it utilizes perkin elmer TSA fluorophores or opal dyes. It was developed with FFP tissues in mind to help address the autofluorescence. This assay can also be followed with immunofluorescence. We have a technical note up on the support page for the dual-ish IF protocol. With the additional purchase of a fourplex ancillary kit, the assay will allow for fourplex capability to detect M four mRNA targets simultaneously. And in the last column is the LS multiplex assay, which is similar to the v manual V2 assay, which utilizes the TSA plus and opal dyes. Now we'll move to the different assays that are available on either the Lacobond RX or Ventana Discovery Ultra automated platforms. If you are interested in the automation platform, please contact your local area account manager. We will have our local field application specialist available for training and troubleshooting on the automation platform. First, we'll go over the RNA scope assays available on the Ligand Bond RX. If you're interested in only one target, then you may choose between the brown or the red assays. If you would like to detect two or more targets on one slide, then you may choose between the chromogenic duplex assay or the multiplex fluorescent assay. The chromogenic duplex assay can be visualized by either brown and red chromogens or green and red combination. As mentioned previously, the LS multiplex assay is very similar to the V2 assay, which, which utilizes the TSA plus and or opal dyes from Perkin Elmer. This assay has the capability of detecting up to four targets simultaneously. Moving on to the assays available on the Ventana Discovery Ultra platform, First, we have the VS Universal HRP assay. This assay is a single-plex assay that can be either chromogenic or fluorescent assay. It can utilize the DAB chromogen or the different fluorophore kits from the Roche Diagnostics. Then we have the VS Universal AP assay that is a single-plex chromogenic red assay. Lastly, we have the Arniscope duplex assay which utilizes brown and red chromogen to detect two mRNA targets. Now that we have learned about the technology and assay workflow, next we will discuss analyzing the assay results. Some questions you may have at this point include, what does the dot mean? What is the significance of dot size? And what is the difference between a dot and a cluster? In this image, in which the RNA scope chromogenic assay has been performed with the red chromogen, signal appears as a numerous punctate red dots of various sizes and intensities and few clusters. It is the number of dots and or clusters that are important, rather than the size of the dot or the intensity of the dot. Each punctate dot equals one mRNA molecule. The small, faint punctate dot pointed by the blue arrow is one mRNA molecule. The slightly larger, darker red, nicely round punctate dot pointed by the yellow arrow is also one mRNA molecule. However, its larger size is due to more double Z probe pairs that, is ha that have bound to the target molecule. In contrast, a cluster pointed by the brown arrow is more oblong with a slightly irregular border. This results from overlapping signals from multiple mRNA molecules. Similar patterns of dots and clusters are, can also be seen in fluorescent versions of the assay. The yellow arrows point to single mRNA molecules with less double Z probe pairs bound to them compared with the dot pointed by the teal arrow. The white arrow is pointing to a cluster with an irregular rather than round shape, resulting from overlapping signals from multiple mRNA molecules. And here's a brief overview of our um, semi-quantitative method of analyzing RNA-scope data. RNA-scope can be quantified by manually counting the number of dots per cell. It is also known as the semi-quantitative 
quantitative scoring method. With this method, a score of 0 to 4 is assigned based on the average number of dots per cell. For more quantitative approaches to data analysis of the RNA scope results, visit the link below where you can download a free guide describing the different methodologies available to quantify your results. If you have further questions, please contact technical support for recommendations. Before we move forward, I would like to reiterate that it is critical to qualify your sample using control probes before running the assay using the target probes. Moving on to optimization, why do you need to optimize your assay? Here are some potential reasons why you may need to optimize. If the samples are underfixed, this can usually lead to, lead to overdigestion of your samples using the standard conditions. If the samples are overfixed, the signal could be weak and you may need to optimize. There are also pr some particular sample types that could require different pretreatment conditions and optimizations, with a few listed here. If your tissue of interest is not listed, or if you're unsure if your tissue has been fixed as per our recommendations, please feel free to reach out to technical support. Sample pretreatment is a very critical step for the success of RNA scope. When running the RNA scope assay on your samples, begin with, with the recommended standard conditions for your sample test. Observe for signal intensity and background with control probes and sample morphology. If recommendations for your sample type are not available in the user manual or a technical note, it is always best to start with standard conditions. This will help us to set a baseline for the, how this assay performs, and based on your results, we can make recommendations to either scale the pretreatment up or down. Both the target retrieval and protease digestion perform on a sliding scale such that you may adjust it depending on what your samples look like or the fixation conditions for your samples. And the optimization on the automated platform is similar to the manual assays. On the automation platform, you would change your epitope retrieval time and temperature as well as the time spent with for the protease incubation. And here is a typical RNA scope experimental configuration. Provided the target is expressed in the sample and the protocol is followed as recommended, the RNA scope assay is guaranteed. Because tissue samples can be highly variable, proper sample preparation and the right controls are essential to an RNA scope experiment. Tissue samples must be properly fixed and pre prepared to ensure good RNA quality and no background due to poor fixation. ACD provides guidelines on how tissue should be fixed for optimal performance of the RNA scope assay. Here are serial sections from a human lung cancer sample on which we performed on the manual assay read. On the left is a section stained with a negative control probe, DATB, which is a bacterial gene that is not expressed in most tissues. As observed in the sample, there should be no signal from the negative control dat B. The panel in the center shows a section from the same sample stained with a positive control probe for the housekeeping gene PPIB. As observed with this sample, you can see fairly uniform detection with the positive control probe, indicating that the RNA quality in this sample is good. Certain tissues may express the positive control probe at higher or lower levels, but in general, you want to see expression throughout the sample. With the results from these two probes, we can have confidence in the test data we see in the right panel. As an example, I am showing a section from the same lung cancer sample probed for the immune checkpoint marker program death ligand 1 or PDL1. PDL1 exhibits a wide range of expression in tumor tissues. In this human lung cancer sample, we observe strong punctate dots with the PDL1 probe, indicating expression of PDL1 in this tumor sample. The controls show us that the RNA quality is good throughout the tissue sample and that there is little to no background staining, and hence we can be confident that the lo localized pattern of expression we observe for PDL1 is in fact an expected pattern. Now, let's review this, some troubleshooting examples and the results after performing optimizations on these samples. In this slide, this shows optimal digestion with a tissue fixed with our recommendations and then treating with the standard conditions. PPIB staining is strong, while the DATB negative control staining is clean. 
and you can see that the tissue morphology is intact and the hematoxylin staining is homogeneous throughout the sample. In this slide is an example of when the sample is overdigested. As compared to the last slide, this data set shows tissues that have been overdigested in which the nuclei are now undefined due to suboptimal tissue morphology and the PPIB staining is slightly weaker than expected. To troubleshoot overdigestion, here is an example of an underfixed sample that is overdigested at, pre, at standard pretreatment conditions. You can see that the negative control on the left with the very weak hematoxin staining, there you can also observe some background dots. Moving forward with the experiments, we then reduced the target retrieval time, which improved the morphology and eliminated the background seen in the negative control. So on the left is standard pretreatment conditions, which overdigested the samples, and on the right is an image of the same sample stained with uh, milder pretreatment conditions. And here's an example of how overdigestion can also affect your positive control staining. Again, in this sample, the underfixed sample is overdigested at standard pretreatment conditions. And then when the pretreatment condition has been reduced, the image on the right, as compared to the image on the left, there, has been, there is better morphology and better signal resolution when using the reduced target retrieval time. In the opposite direction, here are samples that have been underdigested. The PPIB staining is much weaker, but the tissue morphology looks great, showing no signs of overdigestion. To troubleshoot any underdigestion your, on your samples, we would recommend to extend your pretreatment conditions to about in manual, in manual assays, you would increase the target retrieval time to 30 minutes. In this image, you can see that on the left, with standard pretreatment conditions, the PPIB stain is weak. And when the pretreatment conditions have been extended, the image on the right shows that the PPIB staining is more homogeneous and stronger staining. And here is an example of suboptimal fixation. Shown here to the right is an image of RNA scope performed on a sample that was fixed for way too long. And as you can see, the signal is very weak. And hence, we highly recommend fixing the samples as per our recommendations. And here is an example of a successful RNA scope fluorescent multiplex assay. You see in, in this image the three different housekeeping genes and merged on the right. For those that use fresh frozen samples, the images here display how protease pretreatment can affect RNA scope signal quality. With the mouse kidney sample shown in the top panels, you can see there is quite a bit of tissue autofluorescence. But when the sample is appropriately digested using protease 4 at room temperature for 30 minutes, distinct green and red dots can be observed with the control probes. When protease digestion is performed at 40 degrees C, the tissue is overdigested, and not only do you not see any punctate signal, you see an increase in background. Similarly, as shown in the bottom panels with adequately treated fresh frozen mouse brain samples, there is no background and you can observe beautiful punctate signals. And with the tissue overdigestion, you see an increase in background and decrease in signal. One one other known issue with the fluorescent assay is that the, due to the long fixation time, FFPE samples are prone to inherent autofluorescence. This poses challenges for, imaging at, for image analysis. You can then use FFPE if you have background correction software to reduce autofluorescence. And alternatively, we now have de developed a multiplex fluorescent assay that helps to address this issue. If you are still experiencing autofluorescence issues with your assay, please contact technical support. Next, we will, like, we will address the troubleshooting for sample detachment. We recommend superfrost plus slides to ensure optimal sample adherence. If you observe tissue detachment, the likely causes are listed here. We have found that adding an additional baking step can mitigate this issue. 
I will review the additional baking steps incorporated for FFPE and fixed frozen samples, which can also apply to all the different assay types. If you are observing tissue detachment after hydrogen peroxide or target retrieval, then we recommend to add a baking step right before those steps. Or if you are observing tissue coming from the slides after protease treatment, we recommend to add an additional baking step before these steps. Both baking steps are for 30 minutes at 60 degrees C in a circulating dry oven. For sample detachment with fixed frozen tissues, we recommend to dry slides at minus 20 degrees for, 20, for two hours after cryosectioning. And then we recommend to add a post-fixation step before hydrogen peroxide for 15 minutes to an hour at 4C. We have found that the majority of the sample detachment happens after target retrieval, so we recommend adding an additional baking step before the protease steps. After trying the above steps 1, 2, and 3, if you are still observing detachment, we recommend to omit the target retrieval and extend the protease time to 45 minutes. Also, please contact technical support and we can help you to figure out the best troubleshooting path for this issue. For probe-related troubleshooting, if you are working with the two scenarios listed here, please contact technical support. With knockout validations, as we have thousands of probes currently in inventory, we would like to help ensure that the probe you are picking is specific for your wild type versus knockout validation. If you are working with novel gene and no catalog probe is available, please feel free to contact your area account manager or go to our website to get your custom probe design feasibility test started. And for unique sample types, we have recommended sample preparation protocols and um, that are com most commonly used sample tests. If you're working with unique sample types such as whole mount, free floating, or bone, please feel free to contact tech support for suggestions and guidance. Now, we will move on to the different applications of the RNA-scope assay. Presented here are some of the key areas where RNA-scope has been increasingly used. In the next few slides, I will go over some examples of these applications. For many targets, reliable antibodies for IC detection are not available. An example of this is LGR5, which is an intestinal stem cell marker. In this study, the authors used RNA scope to detect LGR5 in human colorectal cancer samples. LGR5 is known to be a stem cell marker in the murine small intestine and colon. However, the localization of LGR5 in human adenoma samples has not been examined in detail, and previous studies have been limited by the lack of specific antibodies. The authors approached very systematically to see the localization of LGR5 expressing cells and to understand differences of alterations in stem cell architecture in human, normal, and adenoma samples of all stages. For many GPCRs, there are either no antibodies available or no reliable antibodies available, so the detection of GPCRs in the tissue context can be limiting. Dopamine receptors are implicated in many neurological processes here, we demonstrate detection of the two distinct neuronal populations marked by the dopaminergic GPCR DRD1, shown in red, and DRD2, shown in green. Using this, in this assay, it, the RNA-scope fluorescent multiplex V1 assay was used. And here is an image of the VGLUT1, VGLUT2, and VGAT receptors in FFPE mouse brain using the multiplex fluorescent V2 assay. And in this study, the authors used RNA-scope-ish to validate the expression of new cell type markers for various neuronal populations identified by single, single nucleus RNA-seq and to visualize CFOS as a marker of activated neurons. One of the most frequently questions asked is, can you combine RNA-scope-ish with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence? And the answer is yes. Both ISH and IC procedures can do have, do have similar workflow as shown here. Both require sample fixation, some kind of pretreatment to unmask your RNA or protein, and subsequent detection. 
The recommended workflow is as shown here. You would pre-treat and permeabilize your tissue or cells first. Depending on the tissue, this might require both heat-mediated target retrieval as well as protease digestion. You would then complete the RNA scope ish portion and then follow with the IHC staining after. Here are some our recommendations to ensure success with your dual ish IC assays. First, all dual ish IC protocols require optimization. In general, it is recommended to combine a working RNA scope protocol with a working IC protocol. In addition, working with antibodies and a protocol that are known and already established with your tissue samples. Second, it is advisable to perform ish first followed by the immunohistochemistry. Third, it is advisable to optimize the IHC assay separately using the RNA scope pretreatment reagents to ensure your protein can still be detected following the RNA scope pretreatment. RNA scope requires the protease digestion to unmark Un unmask the RNA, so do, to, do keep in mind as you may have to optimize the immunohistochemistry. Lastly, the dual ish IT assay works better for highly expressed proteins due to the protease treatment that is used during the RNA scope protocol. We have technical notes available on the support page to combine the ish with IC or IF. If you have further questions, please contact technical support. And here is an example of using RNA scope single plex red assay to detect the PDL1 probe with subsequent IC staining in, in blue for CD45 protein by IHC. And here is an example of the RNA scope fluorescent assay followed by immunofluorescence. In this study, RNA scope was validated. Um, RNA-scope was used to validate transcriptomics results showing that OSMR is expressed in PDG PDGFR positive cells and that the respective ligands OSM and PDGFA are expressed in Schwann cell precursors. Another area we would like to highlight for the use of RNA-scope is the validation of RNA-seq results. The authors use RNA scope ish to confirm the identity of neuronal subtypes identified using single nucleus RNA seq. They performed RNA scope on a set of selected markers that complemented their RNA seq study and confirmed the subtype and layer specific expression of the markers in the cortex. This paper demonstrates a robust and scalable method for identifying and categorizing single nuclear transcriptomes. And if you have any questions at any point of your assays, please visit our, our, our website at acdbio.com. If you click on the support tab, we have a wealth of information including troubleshooting guides, user manuals, technical notes, training videos for the manual assays, as well as previously rec recorded webinars that cover a wide range of different topics and applications. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. In just a couple of more minutes, I will post some of the most frequently asked questions, and my colleagues are still on the line to help address your questions. Please feel free to continue sending your questions through. Again, as a reminder, th this webinar will be recorded and available on the website as previously shown. In the event you are unable to get a question sent through the chat or Q&A feature, please find the contact information for technical support on this slide.